The Mac Observers, Mac Geek Gab, episode 771 for Monday, July 22nd, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome. The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where we take all your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, pretty much anything that you find or we find throughout the week. We distill it, we dissect it, we try to answer it. The goal being that every single one of us, us included, and you too, that's right, learns at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include a new sponsor, mintmobile.com slash mgg you want to go there we'll tell you why in a minute but trust me you want to go there and linode.com slash mgg you want to go there too again we'll tell you why in a little bit for now here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton and here in fearful connecticut this is john f braun how are you mr john f braun Fantastic. That's good. I, you know, I really look forward to I, the way I, I have. We all have our routines, right? We're humans. We're creatures of habit. I'm uh, more of a habit, habitual creature than most. I think. I don't know. Maybe. Whatever. I have my habits. When we do the show, we get together. We sort of talk through things, and then we uh, go and get like tea or whatever. And you can you can be part of all this at uh, MacGeekUp dot com slash stream if you want to be part of 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 all that and we play a little song or whatever while we're going and and getting our drinks and i make tea for myself 99 percent of the time which i did today but i don't take a sip of the tea until the theme music is playing and i like especially today but most days i always look forward to that first sip of tea the way it like you know, it's warm. It hits your throat. It sort of just changes everything. And I've, I've, I've really become accustomed to that. Speaking of my throat, I, I am uh, those issues I talked about, uh, whatever, a month or two ago. I think, John, they were caused by me having my moved my podcasting microphone from being on my left for however many years we've been doing this to being on my right uh, that Bell's palsy that I had, whatever, uh, not quite as many years ago, uh, weakened the right side of my throat. And I think talking, aiming to my right while I talk was causing uh, a more strain on my larynx than uh, than I should be putting on it. I moved it back to the left. Everything's good. I'm happier. I can sing again. Like, it's all good. So anyway, I just, I don't know. Here we are. Do you have anything to share before we go to Andrew or should we just... Should we have Andrew save us here? Dive right in. Diving in, Andrew says, I have a quick question. As the T2 chip becomes more embedded into Apple's devices, do I need to be concerned about time machine backups for devices? In other words, if I start a new time machine backup using an external drive and keep secure boot full security checked in the startup security utility, which you can get to by going into recovery mode and external boot disallow, Will I get caught if the laptop drive dies or if the computer has some other hardware issue? Uh, the answer is yes, you will. Um, you cannot boot your Mac from anything other than the internal drive if you leave it at the defaults and don't go into recovery mode, startup security utility and change this. Um, just to be clear, just I, I, I know I'm, I'm 99 percent sure Andrew, the the person asking asking the question knows this but just for everybody's benefit you can't boot from a time machine backup anyway you'd have to have a clone or a usb stick for example uh, there is the recovery volume on your startup disk so even if something happens to your main installation as long as the hardware is okay you should be able to boot from the recovery volume which is still internal and still allowed by default and then you could restore and use your time machine and all of that stuff but yeah, if something happens to the hardware or if you simply want to boot from your clone, you can't uh, unless you go into startup security utility and allow booting from external media, which is one of the options in the external boot section. So, yeah, it is worth thinking about. I have on my laptop, I, on my MacBook Air, I went in and, and changed that um, to allow 
uh, booting from pretty much anything. And I and I, I I mean, I grok the security concerns. I know why Apple has these options, but it's a great thing to be aware of. And that's kind of why I wanted to start the show with it. Just to just to remind everybody that, you know, you want to know about this before you need to know about it. So. Thoughts on that, Mr. Braun? Well, it'll be good to know once I get a machine with the T2 chip. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is, as, as we all sort of migrate up into these machines, eventually, that's that's exactly what it's what it's good for. Yeah. 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 It's good. While we're on the subject of backups, Bob has a question related to the last episode. Uh, he says uh, we had answered Bob's question about time machine backups and, and all that in the last show. And he says um, it got me to thinking about whether I want or need backups or just copies slash clones of my computer's drive. My understanding is that backups, such as what Time Machine does, give the ability to not only have a copy of the most recent state of the computer, but the ability to go back in time to get earlier versions of files that may have been modified or corrupted. As I have yet to need to go back in time to retrieve a previous version of a document or file, I think I would be fine with just a copy or clone of the hard drive to protect against catastrophic loss. Have you already discussed this or have a tutorial? Any thoughts? Would I need to have a couple of recurring clones spread out over a week or a month? So it's a good question. Um, but the, the sort of the umbrella answer is you need to do whatever you are comfortable doing, right? Backups, clones, whatever it is. What we want to do is make sure you are making that decision eyes wide open. Right now, I'll throw out an example here that might change your approach to your backup strategy it, it certainly changed mine uh, several years ago i went to prepare for a presentation for a, an apple user group that i was going to speak for I, I i may have been i think i was doing a presentation for them that i had done for someone else or at least wanted to use something from a prior presentation so i have a whole folder that i just keep all my presentations in and i couldn't find it it wasn't there i know where it's supposed to be it wasn't there i looked in my time machine backups but they had been reset like, I don't know, three months before or something because time machine and nope, not there. Somehow I must have accidentally deleted this folder from my Mac and just hadn't realized it because I hadn't done any presentations in whatever period of time that was. My clone certainly wouldn't have had that data. It's possible my time machine backup would have had that data, but my clone certainly didn't. Then I remembered about eight or 10 months before that I'd gotten a new Mac and had immediately repurposed the prior one. I think, in fact, it was this machine that I had gotten down in the office and I had, you know, rolled the old one up here for the studio, just like I did this time. And because I was immediately repurposing the Mac, I did what I always do. And I made a disk image clone of the Mac that I was repurposing so that I had, you know, essentially cold storage of whatever data was was going to be on that or was previously on that Mac, just in case I didn't migrate something or didn't copy something, you know, whatever. I just it, may, it gave me peace of mind to go and format that drive and get it ready for, you know, for its next home. I looked and thankfully in that disk image, there was my presentations folder from, you know, eight months prior. I think I lost some edits or something, but. You know, I had every presentation I've ever done in this folder. So now I don't wait for when I get a new machine to do these cold storage archives. I do them once a year and and then I just save them on my uh, disk station or NAS, you know, any sort of whatever, you know, storage you've got there. And uh, and now I know I have, you know, all this historical data going back because you that that's the thing is you haven't yet needed it bob but you might like i'm i'm pretty diligent about things but somehow i you know had that folder selected when i selected something else and hit delete and moved on with my day and you know do to do that's the end of that so yeah i don't know that i would i certainly don't recommend just having a clone but even if you feel comfortable with it now you don't get to change your mind about the past and the future so yeah i don't know thoughts on this mr braun <laughs> you don't get to change your mind about the past and the future right i think that might be the topic of the episode subject to the episode <laughs> oh you may i don't know 
All I know is you should probably, everyone should deploy multiple backup strategies. Yeah. So in my case, I do a clone on a regular basis. I do Time Machine. And I also use uh, various cloud services to uh, back up things as well. Yeah, right, right. That in case something local happens. Yep. Yep. It's smart, man. It's smart. Yeah, because I had same as you one time. I, um, yeah, I don't know what, I don't know what happened, but there, there, there was a case where, yeah, documents uh, uh, kind of like you disappeared. And I'm like, what happened to those? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, get clearly, it was certainly in my case, I'm certain it was user error. And most of the time, that's what it is. It's, you know, or as we like to say, an error between the chair and the keyboard. But, you know. Oh, operator yeah. error. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, good. So hopefully some perspective for you, for all of you on that. Rich has a question. He says, when I am in Safari on my MacBook Pro running Mojave, when hovering the cursor over a clickable link, the cursor intermittently flickers and I can't click the link. If I hit the escape key, the cursor returns to the hand and the link is clickable. This has been going on for quite some time, dating back at least two versions of Mac OS. I sought help at the Genius Bar. They seemed to know what the problem was and supposedly fixed it, but soon thereafter, the problem was back again. Any thoughts or suggestions before I nuke and pave, which I really don't want to do. So I'm, I'm actually curious what the Genius Bar thinks they did or did, uh, because that's, that's interesting. Um, my first inclination in a scenario like this, especially if it's only happening in Safari, would be, well, in general, boot in safe mode, see if that solves it, right? Um, also boot into a separate test user account. You've created one of those, right? If not, stop what you're doing. Go create a test user. Give it admin privileges and a password. Don't forget the password. That way you've got a test user if you can't ever log into your account. This is a helpful thing. Um, but, you know, boot into safe mode, boot into your test user, see if it happens there that'll tell you is it system wide is it some you know third party thing that's loading when you're in regular mode but not safe mode etc um but check other browsers right does it also happen in chrome and firefox if so okay it's not a safari specific thing if it is a safari specific thing maybe a safari extension is at play um that could be it. Go to Safari Preferences Extensions. See what you've got there. Uh, in the chat room, Kiwi Graham at MacGeekGab.com slash stream, as we mentioned, uh, suggested perhaps this is malware trying to hijack links. Uh, you might see that in your extensions in Safari. I've certainly seen it there. You might also see it in System Preferences Profiles, which will only be there if you have a profile uh, installed. So if you don't see it, don't worry about it, but, uh, check that. And then of course, you know, if, if all else fails, run malware bytes and see what, see what that says too, because that's, um, that, that's a great way to get rid of stuff. It seems like the malware vendors, vendors, the malware authors, <laughs> probably a better way to say it. Uh, although malware is a business, so maybe they are malware vendors. Uh, they have like malware bytes has been able to keep up with what they're doing. It seems I have not heard of, of anyone saying I've got malware malware bytes didn't fix it, but um, maybe now I will feedback at Mac uh, Did you say feedback at Mac I did. I said feedback at Mac Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Good stuff. Any, any more thoughts on that, John? No, I'm with you. I've I've had that happen on occasion. It wasn't malware. It was just Safari. Oh, interesting. Every, every once in a great while, I'll have you know something I try to do in Safari and it fails, and I'm like, okay, well, and so my um my routine is okay. Let's try it in Firefox, and then let's try it in Chrome. Yeah, but typically. Whenever I have issue with, you know, something like click on not working, um, it almost always solves the problem by going to Firefox. But like many, my everyday browser is Safari. 
Right. 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 Yeah. But Safari is still my everyday browser too. It, um, it, it, it seems to be the most efficient browser on Mac OS, which is no great surprise it happens to be written, you know, by people that also make Mac OS or at least the same company. So yeah. Um, especially on my laptop, I find battery life with Safari is, is better than the other sort of two major browsers that I might use. So, yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. And I, and I, we sort of said this, but for clarity, Brian Monroe shares, see if it is a system thing or a local user thing. And that's where having that test user account is really helpful to determine whether is this a system wide problem or something specific to your user account. And that, that can just aid in guiding your troubleshooting. So, yeah. Thank you, Brian. Great stuff. Uh, I want to take a minute and I'm really stoked, in fact, to talk about our first sponsor, which is Mint Mobile at mintmobile.com slash MGG. Look, if you're still using one of the big wireless providers here in 2019, have you asked yourself what you're paying for? They have to pay for retail stores, right? They have hidden fees and you might be taking they might be taking advantage of you because they know that you'll just pay. This is what Mint Mobile is here for. Mint Mobile provides the same premium network coverage that you're used to. John and I have tested this. It's actually faster than our big wireless providers, at least in the places we've tested uh, at a fraction of the cost because they don't have stores, right? Everything is online and you buy plans in bulk. Mint Mobile makes it super easy to cut your wireless bill down to just 15 bucks a month. There's no unlimited on Mint Mobile, and there's a reason for that, because you're probably not using all of the data that you're paying. You're not using unlimited data. You can buy different data plans from them, and if you use more, you can actually buy and, and, and top up, you know, just for the month or whatever, but you'll still get some data. Like, it, it doesn't cut you off. It just slows you down. So when you run out of 4G LTE, you get dropped down to slower speeds, but you still get some data so you can still function. They are really into Apple, iPhone, iOS. All your network settings are auto updated when you put their SIM in. They support voice over LTE. All this APN settings, like all that stuff happens. Visual voicemail. It works. Hotspot is built in at no extra charge. It's super easy. You can bring your own phone number. Or you can get a new one from them. They sell iPhones too. A lot of them use iPhones. I talked with the guy who's like the head of the whole thing there. You know, they are they are Apple people like us. Many of them just use iPhones. You got to check this out. So go to mintmobile.com slash MGG. Get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get it shipped to your door for free. Mintmobile.com slash MGG. One more time, cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month. Mintmobile.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Mint Mobile for sponsoring this episode. And g'day, John, and g'day, Dave. This is Andrew in Australia. Dave, over the last week or two, I've heard you both on the Mac Geek Gab and also on Mac Break Weekly talk about the Zoom server software issue and how Apple has run silent updates, I think on two occasions, to remove this software from our machines. There's one bit of the story that's missing for me, and I thought you might be able to do an explainer for us on it. And that is, how do silent updates work? My only experience has been when Apple has done a software update or there's a uh, security update, it says, it tells me that the software update is there, I hit download and then my machine restarts and then I live happily ever after, which is great. But these things, as the name implies, has happened, have happened um, silently. And I'm just intrigued as to two things. One is, why did my machine not restart? And two, why did I not see any software uh, in my trash? Um, yeah, so look, I think that would be of interest to many listeners, and I'm interested myself. And I thought, you are the man to explain us to it so we don't get caught. See you guys. Have a good week. Bye for now. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I uh, had the pleasure of doing, I think it was episode 670, but whatever this week's, the Tuesday, the 16th episode of Leo Laporte's Mac Break Weekly. 
I was on there with them and, uh, and this was one of the things we talked about. It was, uh, it was actually a blast. Of course it was, you know? Um, yeah. So these hidden updates, John, these silent updates you mentioned last week, and, and I mentioned this on, on Leo's show too, for people that were listening, software update or system preferences, software update advanced. There's a checkbox there that says install system data files and security updates. If you uncheck this, I'm pretty sure that would stop these automatic Zoom updates from from coming. I'm not certain. John Gruber uh, t- checked with someone at Apple and, and seems to be pretty certain that this would do that. But you want to make sure unless you have a good reason not to do software updates or security updates, you want to make sure that's checked. Now, how they work. Well, not every update requires your Mac to reboot. Right. If, for example, let's say we're going to delete and disable this web server engine that can all happen. You can do it manually and you don't need to reboot your Mac to do it. That's how these types of updates happen. Patches to the OS that aren't part of the boot process don't require a reboot to uh, to to be applied. So that I mean, and and they don't necessarily I mean, they might be putting they might be removing things in this case. Maybe they are removing the the actual engine that's running the web server. But, you know, Unix is happy to let you delete something without, you know, just moving it to the trash can. In fact, when you move something to the trash can on your Mac, it has not been deleted. Right. Unix doesn't delete it. It's just moving it to a different folder that's then treated a little bit differently by the OS. But um but in these cases, if it's a security update, you don't want it sitting in your trash can. And so Apple just deletes it um, if if, in fact, that's what the update does. So really better to think about as, as I'm talking this through these, you know, security updates, this protect X database, whatever it is. Think of these more as um, system scripts that can run like Apple says, OK, this particular thing needs to be done on all Macs. We need to shut down this web engine or this you know, web server, and then we need to delete that file. And we also need to delete the thing that's going to re- try to restart it at login and fail because it's no longer there. So they write the little script and then they to do that, instead of giving you a set of instructions, they write the script so that your system can do it automatically. They push that script out. You your Mac downloads it because you have this box checked and then your Mac runs the script in the background. So. That think of it that way. And maybe that's is it. Maybe that helps to frame it. What do you think, my friend? I agree. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Now, there are a number of. Yeah, as you pointed out there, um, you know, number one, have that checkbox checked. But um, yes, there are multiple things that uh, Apple deploys to get rid of nastiness. X protect is is one of them, right? Right. Yeah. Protect X protect. That's it. I called it protect X. You, yeah. X protect is the right word. That's right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I was actually, you know, I was poking around. I was trying to find. I, I recall at one point there was a. Um, I thought I had a utility that would list all of the uh, various things that X protect on your system would protect against. There is a file, and if you search, you can. You can find it. There is a file. There's a plist file that actually you can open up and, and uh, look at all that. But I thought that Onyx had. I'm misremembering here, but yeah. If anybody knows, let, let me know. I, I I'd love to see a, a a list of the X Protect stuff without having to open the plist file. But I don't. Yeah, that, I'm, what I'm, program let me do that. I'm finding an article at os10daily.com or osxdaily, however you like to to call it. And there is, you can, there's a default read command um, that looks at system library core services, xprotect.bundle, contents resources, xprotectmeta.plist. And you can pull the version out of that. On my this particular Mojave running Mac, when I run that, I get two one zero three for anybody playing along at home. So, um, if that's if that's helpful for anyone, so yep, I don't know. All right, yep. Okay, uh, Barb has a question. We'll have some answers, and maybe you folks will have some answers, and then maybe in the future we'll actually have even more answers. So 
Uh, Barb asks, I've had a ring doorbell since the fall of 2016. It was awesome until one day in 2018. And then it was junk. On that day, it started only showing the backs of people as they turned around and left. So we never saw their faces. Before that day, I could see the people walking up and leaving when working with their support. They told me it was my network after lots of checks. I know that it is not my network. Nothing in my house has changed. I live in South Carolina. The same thing happened to a friend in Texas and another friend in Florida. All of us have different kinds of networks. So my question is, do you know of any way to make the doorbell video on Ring work properly? If not, can you recommend a replacement video doorbell that is activated by motion or just a video camera in general that is activated by motion? So I don't know that I have a solution for this. It's weird that that you're having it with multiple um, things, but it sounds like maybe, you know, Ring has pushed out several updates to their their software over time and has in some of those dramatically changed the at least the interface. And I think the functionality of how the doorbell looks and sees what's going on. My guess is if you contacted ring support, you've already been through all this, but for anybody that, that has a ring doorbell, if you kind of set it up and forgot about it, which is very easy to do because it just sort of works. It's worth every six months going and launching the app and sort of going into the, the um, sensitivity settings for the, the, the doorbell or the camera or whatever it is, because I, I went in once and it was like, whoa, this has changed dramatically. You can, you have so much more control than you used to have, or it's different controls. So that might be it. Another way to test it is to just launch the app and say view live and see how long it takes for your doorbell to start streaming video direct to your phone. And, you know, I found that it usually takes about two or three seconds to set up that, uh, that stream. That is not how long it takes your doorbell to start recording, by the way. It's just um, in order to get the stream happening, you actually talk to ring servers and then it sets up a direct stream from the doorbell to your phone. Uh, it, it, it's a little weird. So uh, so that's part of but that that two to three seconds is normal. And I would say if you can start seeing video in that two to three second range then there's nothing wrong with your network ring. Your doorbell is able to talk over the network. It's able to stream. It's all of that stuff. So maybe something with their sensitivity changed and it's just no longer working for you and your friends, which, which sucks. And you should report this to ring because you shouldn't just have to buy a new doorbell. All of that said some options. There's the nest doorbells. There's simply safe. Um, there's that company wise. I talked about their bulbs last week, which are now available. You can go buy them uh, for the same price. I paid twenty nine ninety nine for a four pack uh, and then you pay for shipping. So it works out to be about nine bucks a bulb is what I paid. Uh, they don't have one yet, but when they do I guarantee it, it'll be priced really aggressively because that's their that's their M.O. Um, and then uh, we'll put a link. I found some uh, some articles. Uh, you know, from like wire cutter and stuff, re reviewing smart doorbells. And um, John, there's one you're about to start testing from Eufy, the people that make the RoboVac that I use, which is an anchor brand. So I'm curious to, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that once you get it. Are you still? Yeah, yeah. no, I look forward to it because, um, yeah, I've had um, I've had issues with the ring as well, being a bit too sensitive. So you have the opposite um, you point, issue of Barb. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and as you pointed out, uh, you know, all of these guys are constantly updating their algorithms and, uh, you know, it's a hard problem to figure out, you know, what, what am I seeing? Yeah. Well, as, as anybody listening to the show can, and, and my right hand riding John's level can attest, you're pretty close to the street. We can, you know, we can hear cars going by. You must have a window open or something, which is fine. Uh, it keeps me on my toes riding your, your level when I hear that. But, um, and your issue is that it's telling you there's someone at your door when it, a car is just driving by. And this new one from Eufy says it's got human detection in it. So, and I think their example is they show a dog coming up to your door and it doesn't 
you know, if you turn on humans only, then it doesn't do anything if, uh, if it's a dog. So maybe that's your answer in your scenario. So. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Anything else? My good. Yeah. Any more on this topic? Yeah, I'll have to look through my files because. Um, I remember there was one that I saw at CES that tried to. um solve the problem by having two cameras so we'd have one that was looking straight ahead and one looking down and uh, um and i think their claim <clears throat> yeah i'll have to dig around and find that vendor but that was solving the problem of uh, w- what you just pointed out is all right if the uh down facing camera sees something but the up camera doesn't then they're like oh okay it must be a cat or a dog or some other critter and uh i shouldn't tell you about that unless you want to know about it (laughs) right yeah unless unless you want to know about it what the weird part is that rings floodlights use um have like human detection they've got person detection in them you know what (laughs) wise doesn't have a doorbell but they have a camera that you could use so go let's let's not forget about that uh i'll put that in the list that might be your answer because i think you can get those for really like you know it's wise so They've got the wise cam and the wise cam pan. And how much is the wise cam? 20 bucks for the wise cam. And this thing, like, it's like a little robot. It, 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 I don't know. I, yeah, here bucks. we go. I, I gotta get one of these. I actually found, I actually found the product here. It, it's coming back to me. Um, Maximus. Okay. And they claim they are the first dual camera video doorbell. And I believe them. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That's cool. That's cool. Huh? Maximus doorbell. Huh? All right. I'll put that in the show notes too. That's pretty cool, man. Dual cam video doorbell. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to buy those wise bulbs, go do them from, uh, from wise.com. W Y Z E.com. Um, I'll put those in the show notes too, because now they're actually on sale. When I mentioned them last week, I had gotten them as part of their, their, I mean, it was a public thing, but it was their pre-order or whatever, but you can buy one for eight bucks or four for 30. So there you go. That's, um, they're pretty awesome. I'm, I'm pretty stoked with them. So, yeah. Hey, all right, John, I, I have some, some news and a tech problem that we need, you and I need to solve. So right. th- the news is that, um, you know, I was I was suffering terribly from FOMO because Mac stock is coming up and I couldn't go because I uh, had committed to this theater show. We uh, were doing a production of, of the show called Hedwig and the Angry Inch this summer. And and it it's one that I know and have done with this cast. It would have been really difficult for them to sub the drummer part out. And I had committed to do it. So it's like, crap, it's the same weekend as one of the weekends of, of Hedwig is the same weekend as Mac stock. And it was also supposed to be, you know, like these two weekends and then we've got a break and then there's two more weekends in August. These first two weekends were canceled because people got sick because there were other shows happening that burned these people out. And as soon as I like the email went out at 2 a.m. one day earlier this week and by I woke for whatever reason that day, I woke up at five. I saw the email and I booked flights to Mac stock. So I will be there, which is awesome. Smartly, I had booked a hotel and had not yet canceled it. I don't know why I hadn't canceled it. I think FOMO, you know, I was uh, the, the fear of missing out. So uh, so I will be there. And then I started talking with, uh, you know, Mike, who organizes Mac stock and Barry, who organizes sort of all of the after parties. Mac stock, Mac stock really sort of happened because years ago, the first one, because Barry wanted to do this, this cookout at his house. And uh, and then he and and Mike, real Mike Potter realized that, uh, well, wait a minute, you know, we're going to have all these people in town. We should have a conference for them during the day. And so Mike took the job of organizing what now we know as max talk. So, um, it's like, well, if I'm going to be there, you know, me, if I'm going to be at a show, I like to justify the expense by doing something, speaking, you know, something that's a, you know, a, a public sort of thing. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. Selfishly, I would actually just love to go and, and, uh, you know, just be an attendee and hang with all of you that are going to be there and all that stuff. But, um, 
But, you know, you gotta do, we do a thing here, so we got to do a thing there. And we went back and forth on some options and actually had some great options. I mean, his, all his, his speaker schedule, of course, is full because the thing's in a week and a half. Of course it is. But um, we started thinking about, well, what about a live Mac Geek Cab? And uh, so Saturday evening, Barry is having a thing at the, uh, the main hotel, which is the Hampton Inn. And there's going to be like games and stuff and food and, you know, that sort of thing. So at the beginning of the evening, John and I will be recording Mac Geek Gab, I think in one of the conference rooms there at the hotel. I don't think they have a PA for us, though, John. So uh, we need to. Barry wasn't all that concerned about us just projecting. And I, I think we'll be OK. Um, but I started thinking through, OK, you know, what can we do? How can we do this? Um, what you know, what's going to work? And uh, so. We have a mobile recording setup, right? Uh, you know, we can do it all in software. We plug two USB microphones into, uh, I mean, we'll plug them into my MacBook, but we could plug them into any MacBook. Mine just happens to have the rest of the software that we need to record the show. So we will plug them into mine and we can record the show. That's easy. We, we've done that many times. We're, you know, fairly confident that that will work. The question is, I started thinking, okay, well, how do we make it so that the people in the room can actually hear us. I mean, we'll, we'll project and we'll talk like we normally do, John. But wouldn't it be great to give them something, even if it's just a small room, even if we're all, we might all just be sitting at sort of a, a round table, which would be cool because I want to do a stump the geek thing so that people can ask questions. So I, I think I have a second microphone that I can bring so we can have three mics and one of them can be a mic for people to ask questions. And we'll do a shorter Mac Geek Up. I don't think it's going to be our, you know, 90 minute thing. I think I'm aiming for like a 45 minute show. So next next week's show, 772. If you see that it's short, that's normal. You didn't get a short file. So, John, uh, well, first thoughts about all of this. Any any tweaks to the, the vision here before we start talking about some of the particulars? Oh, I'm with you so far. OK, cool. Um, and you have a microphone you can bring, right? Your USB mic. So it will be good. And actually, I mean, it's Mac stock. So if we need a mic, my guess is someone like Guy Searle would have a mic from the My Mac show. And we could probably borrow that for the, uh, for the, for the listener mic, you know, some USB mic. So now that we've got all that sorted out, the question is, okay, could we give them a little something? And I started thinking, well, wait a minute. I always travel with like a JBL flip or something so that I can listen to music in my hotel room. Those have, I don't want to mess with Bluetooth um, because there's weird delays and stuff, although that might actually be okay. But those speakers also have headphone in like mini eight input. So why couldn't I bring a mini eight cable and perhaps even bring like a 20 foot extension on a mini eight cable so that we can have the speaker a little further away from us and perhaps closer to the people that actually want to hear out of it. Uh, so we don't have to turn it up as much and we get less bleed through and less echo and all of that. I mean, it's going to be a little echoey anyway, because you know, we're in a, we're not in our, our normal scenario, but, um, but that's, I'm thinking of, you know, we can, we can use the little speaker to give you know, just a little bit of extra amplification. I, I think that might work, man. What do you think? Because we have a, I have a three-way, normally when we plug in, I have a three-way um, splitter for, uh, for our headphones. But we only ever use two of the three jacks on that. So, could use the third one to go to the speaker. What do you think? Am I crazy? You're the audio guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know, but you know, like, you, you, you grok the big picture. Yes. Yeah. So you think it's going to work? That's really my question is like, yes, sanity check. OK, <laughs> so we need to make sure I'm going to make a packing list here because I need to make sure I bring the speaker. So speaker, I need uh, those speakers are weird because they have a mini eight jack just like my Mac does. So I need a dual male mini, you know, headphone to headphone dual male jack. OK. And then I need the extension cable and I need to make sure I bring the three way splitter and don't just use a two way. And 
and then I need an extra microphone, maybe, times two. If I can fit an extra microphone in. I hate checking a bag, but, you know, this might, I might have to take the sacrifice. So, yeah. Yeah, good. All right. I think we can make this work, John. I think so. I'll have to, I'll have to enlist you to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll need to, we'll need to jointly set up because we'll have to, I think we like, this thing starts at like six 30 and I, I want to plan to like start recording, you know, relatively er, on the early side. I want to sort of record on the first side because we're going to be hungry and we're going to want to eat. And so let's get the show done and then we can go eat and you know, all that stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Does this seem like a workable plan? I'm ready. Okay. Well, that's good. I'm glad one of us is. I have a very tight turnaround because I'm driving back from Montreal Thursday. And then I think my flight leaves Boston at 9 a.m. Friday. So I need to like get home, unpack, repack, don't forget anything and jet off to Mac stock. So I'm squeezing this in, but I think it should work out. I hope. <laughs> I hope. All right. Anything else about Max Talk you want to share? Share? No, I'm just looking around and I don't see my mic. I think it may still be in my suitcase. I yeah, I have. See, that's why I think I have an extra one because I keep one in my suitcase. But I think I have a a second one that I used to like ship out to like when we had guests on the small business show or whatever. We used to ship them a mic. We we don't really need to do that anymore. But um, I think I've got you know a second second mic so yeah make make sure you have your mic and make sure you have headphones i I mean if you didn't have headphones it wouldn't be the end of the world but eh, make sure you have them you can always take them off if if they're not The, the thing about headphones and podcasting and why i find them valuable even if we're not playing like audio comments or anything which we probably won't be playing for that particular episode um is having headphones in reminds us to to like affect the proper mic technique and be up on the mic instead of, you know, just drifting away and like getting distracted. Oh yeah, that's right. You got to come back when you hear yourself going away. Like you naturally just get back on the mic. So, and that's especially important when we are in a room that has, you know, more noise in it from like humans and those sorts of things. Cool. All right. I'm feeling good about this. I, I think we can, I think we can make it happen, man. Okay, uh, I want to talk about Linode, our second sponsor here for today at linode.com slash MGG. That's L-I-N-O-D-E dot com slash MGG. Some of you might call it Linode. That's fine. There's a whole, you could, it doesn't matter. But it, it you know, it's because they're Linux servers. So there you go. That's where the name, I, I assume that's where the name comes from. So Linode, L-I-N-O-D-E dot com slash MGG is where you go to start setting up your Linode server. And the cool part is you can get a server that's like five bucks a month, or you can get a server that's got like a dedicated CPU and distributed and you can like go nuts. They can scale you all the way up, but no matter what you're on, you get native SSD storage on every server. You're connected to their 40 gigabit network on every server industry leading processors on every server and you get to pick which of their 10 worldwide data centers you're going to be in and there's more opening up so you really get to like get exactly what you need and nothing more but I'll tell you this I've been I mean we've been hosting on Linux for 20 years with with Mac Observer and what we would effectively call the cloud now it doesn't you know it wasn't the cloud back then cuz that term didn't exist but The thing that slows down your typical web server more than anything else is the disks. If the disks are slow, your database reads are slow, your site comes up slow. So even on that Nanode server, which is their five bucks a month starter or, you know, the the lower tier, it it may not be just a starter for you. Like, depending on what you're doing, that Nanode server at five bucks a month may be exactly what you need. But you still have that SSD storage. That's what sets this apart. Really great stuff. You pay for what you use with hourly billing if you don't need the server on all the time. And you get to deploy and maintain your infrastructure very easily and cost effectively. 
And if you don't want to think about it, they've also got their cloud manager that lets you like, let's say you want to do WordPress. You just say go with WordPress. It installs everything you need. If you want to install everything you need, you can, but they'll do it for you. They've got these templates set up. Essentially, you just click a button and boom. Now you've got WordPress. You've got MySQL and Apache and all the stuff that you don't even need to know is there already going. Here's where it gets better. Go to linode.com slash MGG. Then use promo code MGG2019. You get a $20 credit. Yep. 20 bucks added to your account. Guess what? Nanode. Five bucks a month. That's four months worth of a Nanode on the house just because you're a listener. Linode.com slash MGG. Promo code MGG2019. Our thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. We have some tips to go through, John, and some cool stuff found, including finally one from Pepcom that is now available that uh, that you've been checking out. So uh, so I'm excited about this segment here. This is good. Uh, But we'll start with a quick tip from Scott, because this is actually so smart. He says, I don't know if you had discussed this before, but I discovered something cool. This is the epitome of a quick tip. Have you ever wanted to print a web page, but it's so full of visual elements, including ads, that the print formatting is just all screwed up and you just can't print the information you want? Well, Apple has a built in answer for you in Safari. If the page is capable of being displayed in reader mode, the reader button will appear on the left side of the URL bar. It's just like three little lines and that's just how it works. Click the reader button and then print your page in reader mode because reader mode strips out all that stuff and just makes it easy to read. And you can print what you see in reader mode just by doing, you know, command P or file print or however you want to do it. Safari will render the page as it appears in reader mode, call up the print dialog and you're good to go. And of course, as an added bonus, he says, instead of printing the page, you can save it as a PDF or do whatever else is in your PDF menu, like saving it to Evernote if you're an Evernote person, etc. It's all right there. Scott says this is one way to not get caught. And I appreciate it, Scott. I never really thought about this before. This is a great, great tip. So pretty cool, huh, John? Yeah, I've every now and then I've uh, yeah, I'm going to have to try that cuz uh I've had cases where I try to print something and what I see in the print preview is not what I want. <laughs> well, there is a way that you can set and we've done this I honestly don't know if we have it in the current iteration of of macobserver.com, but I think we do that you can set a separate style sheet for print mode. So when someone goes to print your web page, you can choose what elements are there or not there. Um, and and some websites employ that better than others. So that may be why at times you go to print and somebody has some weird style sheet that actually strips out the things you wanted to print. Or if you want to print what a web page actually looks like as a web page, that can be really difficult. Sometimes you got to do like screenshots in order to actually get it because the print stuff goes through the print style sheet and, you know, gets changed. So, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right. Ready for the next tip, John? Mm-hmm. All right. Jed says, um, I figured this was a combination of a former tip and discussion and Eero simply being awesome. Although what he's about to share it is not limited to Eero. You could do this with any router. And I love this idea. He says, I'm moving. And due to the annoyances of life and timing not always working as expected, although we moved out two and a half weeks ago, we have yet to be able to move in to our new place. Yep, it happens. He says, so my family of four has been relying on the kindness of friends and we've been staying at different friends houses while they're away on their summer vacation or in Airbnbs, etc. They all provide us with their Wi-Fi password. But he says, the problem is, as we get to a new place. We have to all enter the Wi-Fi passwords on our devices. And sure, iClouds will sync them and move them around, but it's just kind of a pain. More so, he says, when you're actually living there and like living life as opposed to vacationing somewhere where, you know, your your schedule is not your typical daily schedule. And he says, so what I'm doing instead is I just take my main base Eero 
and plug it into their cable modem. Bring your own router. Plug it in. Now, every device you own knows how to connect to that Wi-Fi because it's your Wi-Fi just in a different location, just like it'll be when he moves into his new house. It's, it's one of these brilliantly simple things that just makes so much sense. I could even see bringing it with you on vacation if you've got a family of four and you each have two or three devices and you don't want to mess with it. You just go and you plug in your thing and you're good to go. I told my family about this last night. And they all looked at me. I'm like, don't worry. I'm not going to bring a router with us. We're going to Montreal for a few days before Max Stock, as I said, for a little uh, little family time away. And uh, we're doing an Airbnb there. And and I'm like, no, I, I won't bring it. Now, now that I've said this, I will regret not bringing a router with me for some reason. But uh, but anyway, there you go. He says, the nice part is everyone's Wi-Fi is just like it was at home. No need to distribute the password four to eight times and have someone make a typo and all of that stuff. He says, the other extra nice tip in the same bag, I put my Apple TV better than figuring out someone's cable or Netflix or whatever. He says, I just plug it in and let the kids veg out on Netflix or whatever they want because it, too, knows how to connect to the Wi-Fi. And we're already logged into all of our services. So bring your router, you know, and it's nice if it's something like the Eero, which is pretty compact. Uh, but bring your router, bring your Apple TV and it saves you a headache. I, I can see that totally saving time. I, I I do that dance every time you get to an Airbnb. It's like, OK, I got to get everything on the Wi-Fi and all that stuff. If you just plug it in, that probably takes less time than doing the dance on all your individual devices. So great advice, Jed. Hopefully that that turns the light bulb on for someone other than just me. I can't imagine it won't. So pretty good. Huh, John, you want to tell us about your uh, cool stuff found, Mr. Braun? Yeah, I used to do, uh, yeah, I used to, uh, that's why I got an airport express was to do exactly what you were talking about. Right. When you had ethernet in hotel rooms. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yep. Cool. So here's a cool stuff that we, uh, we saw at Pepcom and I think it's pretty cool. My charge has a new product here. It's the, my charge solar charger. PowerFold 8000. And what is the 8000? Well, it has 8000 milliamp hours of juice, which um, should be able to charge most of your devices once and maybe even twice. Um, But here's the fun part. So it has two USB ports. So you can charge two things at once. Um, It also has a micro USB, so you can charge it. But then here's the fun part. And, uh, you know, said it was a solar charger. And the thing is, it also, you can, um, you can take the unit and uh, dock it, I guess, (laughs) with, um, with a a group of solar panels that they provide as well. And also kind of acts as a, as a, a case. A case for the battery. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what's interesting about this and and we've been waiting. To, in fact, there's another thing from my charge that we're just waiting for it to become available to tell you about it because we don't want to tell you about something you can't go and buy. Um, the one that that we're linking to here is actually not. I'm realizing now it's still not the one that we saw at Pepcom because I believe the one we got from Pepcom has two notable differences. Same form factor. It's got the battery. It's got the fold out solar panels. It's got two USB ports on it. I'm pretty sure the one we got at Pepcom Pepcom is a 10,000 milliamp hour power bank, not an 8,000. But I could be wrong about that. What I'm certain I'm right about is that it also has a Qi coil in it. So you can charge Qi right on top of the thing. And that doesn't seem to be happening, right? Doesn't yours have a Qi coil or am I confusing things terribly? Uh, I do not believe so. No, the the other coil. Yeah, I don't think it does. Oh, I'm pretty sure mine does because I've charged with it and not with a cable. So I, I think there's a new version of this coming with a Qi coil on it. And if I'm wrong, well, I'll tell you next week, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not wrong about this. Did, do you have yours right there? Uh, I can get it. Like, how long would it take you to go get it? Uh, 
probably about 30 seconds. <laughs> All right. Hold on. I, I will talk about another cool stuff found and we will circle back to this. Okay. All right, go. So, uh, Jay, <laughs> this is real time, folks. Jay shares a cool stuff found with us. He says, as you were talking about back to my Mac replacements and remote access software in a recent episode, I thought of two pieces of software immediately. First, Jump Desktop is what I have used since Log Me In raised their prices to remote access my Mac and Windows boxes. I like the interface. I like its features. It does have support for multiple monitors, too. So if you have multiple monitors on your Mac, you can use those. It is a paid app. He says, I think it's like 29 bucks in the Mac App Store and 15 in the iOS App Store. And they have a client for Windows that is free. The other app that I have not used, but I have heard others rave about is screens from Adovia. Yeah, we've mentioned screens here many times. Similarly, he says it is paid 29 for the Mac, 19 for iOS. Screens is the one I use. And it, uh, it's just so smooth. Uh, he says both apps support RDP and VNC, so they can remote into any machine that supports either protocol protocol locally. But both have a helper app for easing remote access that only works for Mac OS or Windows. Thanks, Jay. We'll put links to uh, both Jump Desktop and Screens in the show notes because uh, because that's cool. I, I don't know that I'd ever heard about Jump Desktop before, but um, but there we go. So, yeah, there you go. All right, John. Back to uh, back to the my charge here. Tell us if you put your phone on it and and you have to like you know power the battery on because the battery's not on all the time. Mm-hmm. But does your phone start charging? No, really. Hmm. Ah, man, I would have sworn mine did that. Mine is way too far away for me to go and get real time during the show here. So I'm gonna have to uh, I'm gonna have to follow up on that. But we'll put a link in the show notes to the to this solar. Mm. Oh, and it's got an LED flashlight in it, too. It does. Yeah. Yeah. And you can also set it to do uh, SOS if uh, if you're in distress. Right. So that's kind of right. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great for like a camping trip or whatever. I mean, it's kind of got all those elements. Hey, man, are you sure it doesn't have a cheek oil? I, I feel like I charged I put it my phone th- on it and it's not uh, it's not charging it. And so. it's on. Right. Like you can see the battery mm-hmm. readout at the top. Of, OK. Uh, yeah, yeah. May, maybe I'm just crazy. Maybe, uh, maybe Dave's crazy. That's what I'll put as the subject to this chapter. So there you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, one last tip while we're, while we're on there. Thanks for, for going and getting that. That's great. Uh, Neil has, uh, has a tip for all of us keyboard maestro users. And, uh, he says, I'm a big keyboard maestro user. And while I do not tend to download other people's macros because I kind of like to build my own, others might download macros more often than me. But I do it occasionally. Searching, searching. I think he typed this with uh, with with Siri searching the keyboard maestro forums. Recently, I came across a posting by Peter Lewis, the keyboard maestro author that I thought merited sharing. It turns out that there is a potential risk when you import macros. If the macro is installed in its activated state, it could run automatically before you have had a chance to review it. For example, if a macro has a trigger to run every second, it will run virtually immediately after you've installed it. This provides a window for a potentially malicious individual to cause damage to your system. I would hope that those sharing keyboard maestro macros would not do this. And I've never heard of it happening, but it seems like good and courteous practice to always distribute macros for download in the inactive state so the end user can deliberately activate it after review. But in the real world, there's potential bad actors. Peter has provided a safety mechanism. If you hold down command, option, shift, control when importing a keyboard maestro macro, again, command, option, shift, control. When importing the macro, they will be imported in the disabled state regardless of what they were saved as, so you can review and decide whether or not to activate. I didn't know about this before and have kept a note on it for reference and wanted to share. So there you go. Thank you so much for that, Neil. That's that's great advice. I, I like you, I, I am a trusting individual most of the time, but um, but you know, that could bite you for sure, because keyboard might you've already given keyboard maestro access kind of to your system. So you're now that's a that's a it's a pretty strong attack vector right there. 
I wonder if perhaps, uh, you know, the default behavior of keyboard maestro should be to import macros in the disabled state regardless, or ask you if you're importing a macro, hey, this is enabled. Do you want it that way or should it be disabled? Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Peter Lewis adds something like that in an update, especially after hearing this conversation. So there you go. All right, Mr. Braun, what do we uh, what do we have? I've got some some questions about NAS. Uh, we've got some more tips. We've got all kinds of good stuff. Shall we? Uh, shall we jump to? Uh, let's jump to to Ari's question about NAS. Shall we do that, John? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, Ari writes. Um, after having set up and worked with Synology for several years now, I'm starting to encounter occasionally use cases where some of the weird quirks of using a Synology disk station offset the benefits, making it less of a magic bullet scenario than, uh, than it can be for some folks it says in the case of uh, one particular client, he says he's having a bunch of weird issues with his DS 418 J, uh, including that it's indexing very slowly and being very cumbersome to search with spotlight and he says perhaps this is because he's got a J series with a you know lower end CPU, or maybe he needs more RAM um, in order to get those indexes happening properly. Because Synology will, your disk station will do its own indexing, and then uh, it will expose that index to the finder to be searched with Spotlight, which is pretty cool. But it has to be beefy enough to index whatever you throw at it, and if you have lots of files, uh, it may not be able to keep up. We see it on our Macs, right? That that Spotlight Indexer wants to run all the time for some reason. So there you go. He says he has problems with SMB butchering his file and folder names. Uh, he has inevitable issues with Time Machine backing up as a network drive. Weird errors connecting to the shares from the finder over the network. And uh, huge problems. He's a, a, a music I think producer or something huge problems, saving files and instruments from logic and other music software, forcing him to split his logic files and other miscellaneous issues. He says, um, he's not really use it's he's the only one using it and he's not really using any of the NAS E functions like a distributed media library or Synology drive to sync files, you know, remotely and locally, like all of those cool things that you can certainly do with a disk station says this guy isn't doing, he's just using it as a place to store his files. And we've been slowly turning the conversation towards setting him up with a direct attached solution, something like raid or a JBOD solution, JBOD being John, do you know the uh, you know what JBOD is? Just a bunch of disks. That's exactly it. Yep. <laughs> uh, and in letting software do raid if we want. Because of that, he says, I've been looking at the OWC Thunder Bay 4, which is an enclosure only solution, and then migrating the data from his NAS over to that using his existing drives. Um, any sense? Well, he's got a couple of questions. Is there a way to do the migration smoothly if he wants to use the same drives? And can you give a sense of how much management and configuration uh, the software raid will require? He says, I'm hoping that we can sort of, you know, get it set up and have headaches eliminated. So, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. If you're just going to use something in a single user scenario where you're not going to, you know, you're just storing files and you're not looking to, you know, utilize any of the network functions of a network attached storage device, then a direct attached storage device is better. Um, there are a couple of ways to go with this. Drobo sort of pioneered the whole easy to use direct attached storage approach uh, with, you know, the, their original Drobo. And now they have several different direct attached options. They, they handle the management of it though, in that you just put the disks in and it appears as a volume and that's great because it makes it really easy to use, but it is sort of a black box in that sense. I mean, it's a black box in a literal sense, but also figuratively, you don't get to uh, control. I mean, you get to tweak, you can create different volumes and, and you do get that sort of control. But, you know, you don't get to pick wh what CPU you're using. It's just whatever trouble put in the box. That's what you're getting. And the benefits of soft raid, software raid, I should say, soft raid is a a 
piece of software that does raid and is sold by OWC because Tim Standing, the guy who developed Soft Raid, now works at OWC. Um, software Raid is actually better than Hardware Raid in a lot of scenarios. And the reason is, and, and it took me, I had to have a conversation with Larry O'Connor over at OWC to, to finally see the light on this. But, you know, the CP with, with a raid scenario, things get really slow when you have to do like a rebuild of the raid and, uh, and John's got people driving by and I, I didn't catch that in time. Sorry. Uh, you know, it, it, because the CPU is doing a lot of work in terms of that and your Mac doesn't know when the raid is doing one of these rebuilds. Uh, so, you know, things aren't quite managed the right way, but your Mac CPU is going to be way faster than any CPU you're going to get in a, especially in a consumer grade raid. And all of this stuff is built into Mac OS, including drivers to mount a volume that's managed with soft raid so if you've got a soft raid volume that you've chosen to use this third party raid uh piece of software which you could get from owc and you would get with your your um i think you get it with the thunder bay or some version of it uh you could take that and plug it into another mac and it would mount like you don't need to worry about oh it doesn't have the drivers or anything it does they're built into mac os you know they've made sure of that so and, but you know disk utilities raid is functional it's not quite as full featured or as efficient as soft raid but it's very functional and and simple uh to and of course it works on every mac as well once you create it so getting one of these jbod uh things you know where you can just put your discs in and then you choose how to manage them can be a really powerful thing and uh and i i you know it took me uh, until i guess probably sometime in the last year that I finally saw the light on why this makes so much sense, but it makes so much sense, especially for somebody like you're talking about, unfortunately taking the drives from your Synology and just putting them in this. I, I, it would be a shock to me if it would mount. I don't think they will. I think we would have heard about that. I think you're going to need to copy the data to somewhere else, put the discs in and then, you know, copy the data back you might be able to get away with shrinking your Synology down if if he's not using all of the space that's on those. And if, you know, if he's got four drives in his Synology and he could fit the data on two of them, then maybe you, you know, you break the RAID in the Synology. You put two of those disks in the uh, in the JBOD, you copy the data over and then you can move the other disks over after the fact. It's probably not workable. You probably need to put them somewhere else. But, you know, think about that option. So. It is uh, it, it, software raid is if you're doing direct attached, I would strongly consider yeah doing some flavor of software raid, either Mac OS is built in or or soft raid. So what do you think, Mr. Braun? I'm with you on the Drobo thing. Wait, what, I still what? think it's a good solution for some people. And uh, when I've seen them at uh, recent shows that I've been to, uh, especially the Thunderbolt ones, man, they're smoking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you have had re like relatively recent experience with <clears throat> a direct attached Drobo. I have not it like their new ones. I have not tested. And I felt like the company was kind of, I mean, they were rudderless for a while. They brought in Mahir Shah uh, as their new CEO, but about a year, maybe two years ago. And I know he was really working to kind of get them on track. He had, we actually interviewed him on our small business show. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, but, you know, he was working to get them on track. He, he understood sort of the challenges that they had faced, but I haven't really heard a whole lot from them since then. So I don't know where they are on that track, which is why, which is why I sort of was, you know, hesitant to, to, be too bullish on them but but if you've seen them at like did you see them at your photo shows or whatever is that right that's yeah that's the last time i saw them yeah yeah and they were you know running uh you know they were showing it they were running uh i think it was a uh, black magic uh speed test sure and, uh if i recall correctly they were getting like in the thousands of uh megabytes per second i think oh they should be yeah. For, mm -hmm. I mean, they should be. Yeah, I would. I would think so. I mean, it 
yeah, if you've got Thunderbolt going and you've got multiple drives, and we can do that in our in our MacBooks now, so we should be able to get that and more, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, you know, the Synology may be too much for some people. Well, it's, yeah, it's the I mean, it's the wrong tool for that particular job. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Cool. All right. Uh, a couple of geek challenges. The first thing I want to do, or the next thing I want to do, is thank all of our premium supporters. Uh, if you go to macgeekab.com slash premium, you can uh, learn all about this. But essentially, this is a program for those of you that can and would like to support us directly. Certainly not mandatory, uh, but it definitely helps. And we very much appreciate all the support that we get this way. So. Uh, contributions from folks on our biannual plan at 25 every six months uh, are George from Surrey, Kurt from Princeton, Blat Boy from Long Island City, James from Mississippi, Graham from Devon, Robert from Oklahoma City, and Mark from Connecticut, who lives about five minutes from where I used to live there. I happened to notice as I saw the, the details of the payment and all that stuff come through. So thank you to all of you. Uh, for that and on our monthly ten dollar plan mike from kansas bob from la Peche, dave from saugerties timothy from tennessee jeff from connecticut frank from tunbridge jim from san jose john from pennsylvania santiago from florida john from north carolina barry from uh overhead although we get to see him next weekend at uh, max stock tony from middleborough and ken from honolulu thank you to all of you as well so Thanks so much. It really, it, it's, it means a lot and helps a lot. So very good. All right. A couple of geek challenges, John. The first comes from listener Neil, who says, listening to the discussion of purchasing large capacity drives instead of keeping around a bunch of older low capacity drives reminded me that I probably have a dozen one terabyte hard drives sitting around all unused. I was wondering about your thoughts on how best to recycle or dispose of them. I hate to just send them to electronics recycling, but I haven't spun them up in years. Maybe they don't even work anymore. And I wonder if you know of any service or organization that finds a way to repurpose these drives. Do any of the manufacturers have a recycling program? Some do. Uh, it seems just a shame to toss them, he says, but they've been sitting in a box unused for long enough that I know I'm not going to use them. Yeah, I it would I would I love the idea of, you know, a, an organization that would repurpose them. Uh, I don't know of any. And that's why I put it up as a geek challenge. So if anybody knows, send it to us. We already said the email address. Actually, if you're a premium listener, premium at MacGeekab.com. But otherwise, I think I, uh, because it's in the in the interest of a good cause, John, I'm going to break the rules. Feedback at MacGeekab.com. So we'd love to hear about that. Any thoughts? Do you know of any uh, any things for this, John? Uh, I, I mean, heck, they may still be good. You know. Well, that's it. Yeah. Know, why we would want to get get yourself an array? You know. Yeah, but I mean, how big would the array need to be for it to be? I mean, you know, Neil has they they have outlived their their usefulness to Neil, right? He needs more storage than. I mean, he would have to pay for like if you buy a, you know, what are you going to spend a few hundred bucks on a, a J bod and you're going to get three terabytes out of it? You know, if you put four drives in or something, it's like, well, OK, <laughs> like there's a there's a, a, a cost benefit scenario there where it's like, well, that same few hundred dollars into a J bod with larger disks actually gets you storage that you're going to be able to use. He's not going to use these. So the question is, can someone right? And and what could what could they do with them? Yeah, I agree with you. If you can still use them, great. But that's he's past that point, right? So, yeah, I would I would love to know if there's some you know place you know like that like the MIT flea market or whatever like where where people come and and actually like take these things and use them and like you know are there classrooms that could use these things? Probably not, but maybe actually probably so. There's got to be somebody out there. Hopefully, somebody knows of a couple places we can we can recommend in the show you've never heard of any of these things john 
No. Okay. <clears throat> there he is. All right. There was school. Hmm. Maybe a school. I don't know. It, right. Like, I mean, it, you know, if there's somebody's doing some projects where they need storage that isn't huge or fast, you know, like, okay, cool. Or somewhere that's, you know, needs drives to take apart to learn how to service a, a hard drive when, you know, problems, when things go sideways. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Mike has a question that I think is a bit of a geek challenge for us. He says, my Google Foo uh, is failing me in search of a video editing application or applications that would let me start working on an iPad Pro. And then when back in my studio, move to the Mac right now, he says we do roughs in Luma Fusion on an iPad and then Final Cut Pro back in the office. What a pain. As always, your wisdom is appreciated. I, I mean, iMovie comes to mind, right? Because you can iCloud those files and they're openable in both places and all of that. But I think he's looking for something a little more pro professional than iMovie, you know, lets you do. So I don't know the answer here and that's why it's on the geek challenge list. Maybe someone does. Do you know of anything? Does anything come to mind as we're hashing through it here, John? For, <clears throat> for iOS? Well, it, yeah, for something, you know, cross platform essentially, right? Like you could start on iOS, start doing a little bit of edits and then, you know, let it like move the project over to your Mac and and continue along that path and preserve what you've done on iOS. Yeah. I it didn't nothing came to mind for me either. So all right. Um we will never have enough time to get through everything. That's just how it goes. The show has gotten long enough over the years. You know, I mentioned before that we're gonna do a forty five minute show at Mac Stock, or at least that's <laughs> that's the goal. That's where Mac Geek Gab was when it started, you know. So and nothing official ever changed it just stretched so uh dan in the last episode we were talking about disk space discrepancies and snapshots perhaps being the the cause and sure enough um mike from bombic software who writes carbon copy cloner gave some guidance on that and he said for sure i'm i'm pretty sure that's what it is and as it turns out scott uh who had the problem confirmed yep it was snapshots so great you you find those in carbon copy cloner you actually click on the volume time machine doesn't let you see your snapshots that it's created there's no interface but carbon copy cloner will let you see its snapshots or time and time machines i should say um the open carbon copy cloner in the lower left is where you would click to to look at that and uh, and you will see them and you can remove them from there. So it's not uh, perhaps not as obvious in the interface as as uh, Scott was hoping initially, but he certainly found it. And so thank you to everybody for that. Dan, uh, Dan shared. He says, I have used the TM util command and found all the snapshots that way from the terminal as well. So that's another way to do it. But uh, but he he you know he also confirmed that you know Time Machine and Carbon Copy Cloner use APFS snapshots and it's configurable in Carbon Copy Cloner. You can actually set some of those options in there. It really is, as far as I found, Carbon Copy Cloner is the best interface to manage APFS snapshots that exists, and it will show you how much space is being taken up. It it you have to give it a minute when you when you launch it. There's a volumes. Option or section on the lower left of Carbon Copy Cloner. Click on your boot volume there. It will show you the list of snapshots. And then shortly thereafter, that list will be populated with sizes. And you get to decide what you can delete them right from here. You can restore right from here. And right from here, you can turn on Carbon Copy Cloner's snapshot creation and retention um, policy. And then you can set how often you want it to recycle them out and uh, and you can even have it do it based on the amount of free space you have, which is awesome. So this is very cool. Snapshots are pretty awesome because they happen very, very quickly and they allow you to, you know, just freeze a, a point in time, which is great. So thank you to everybody that that wrote in on that, including Mike Bombick from, uh, you know, 
the author of Carbon Copy Cloner. Great stuff. We love it. We love that we have lots of listeners that can teach us lots of things. It is good. Bill has a question, though, John, about snapshots. And uh, he says, I ran Disk Utilities first aid function on my iMac. And one of the things it points out is snapshot is invalid. Should I be concerned by that? He says, I've seen this on my MacBook Pro. Of course, sometimes it's different. Um, I've actually seen this a lot, too. And I, when I first saw a snapshot is invalid, like it'll say snapshot is invalid. And then it'll say, you know, volume cleared successfully. Like everything's good. It's like, wait, you just told me my snapshot's invalid. As I understand it, this is an okay error to see. I don't quite understand why that's an okay error to see, John. But, um, but just seeing, if you see other errors with it, there might be more to it, of course. But just seeing snapshot is invalid is not necessarily um, a problem in and of itself. Uh, have you, have you, you've, I feel like we've talked about this before, John, but have you seen this before? Uh, there was that thing with OneDrive where you would also get reports of snapshots not being good. Mm. Remember? Mm hmm. I do. I do remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, all right. So there you go. Um, I'm trying, I'm looking through our tips here to see what um, Andrew has a great tip from that related to when I was talking in the last show about keeping a paper list or creating a paper list of all the apps that I had installed uh, on this machine before effectively I nuke and paved it. And uh, he says, what I do from time to time is do a screenshot of my applications folder and then I store it in Evernote. So I have a record of everything I have installed. He says, sometimes, of course, it takes a few pages of screenshots to get the whole list. Also, Clean My Mac has a list of installed apps. It breaks them up into two categories from the App Store and from elsewhere. He says, that's really handy, too. So thank you for that, Andrew. That's, those are good. I forgot about Clean My Mac's list of apps. That's pretty good. I like that. That's good. Thoughts on any of that, Mr. Braun? I'll give you another one. Okay. Um, system information. Oh, yeah. Soft. So Apple's a system info, which you can get to if you go to About This Mac, and then you click on System Report, or just run the System Information app. There's a Software Applications category. And uh, here's the fun part, is if you want to save... Or what you can do is save your system report and then come back to it later. Oh, so yeah. There's another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Good stuff, man. Cool. Uh, I think we have time for two more because this first one's quick. Ben reminds us or corrects us, in fact. Um, in 770 last episode, we were talking about Google Photos and... Um, getting your data out of it. And one of the options we discussed was there, well, was not is a checkbox in Google's interface where you could have your Google photos put as a folder on your Google drive. And that went away back in May, unfortunately. So uh, that's not an option anymore, sadly. So thanks for that, Ben. Thanks for the heads up on that. And sorry for uh, the wild goose chase for anybody that, tried to figure out where that was because it's not anymore you might still have the folder if you had done this previously but the folder will not auto update nor will it auto import so it is a frozen in time folder uh, and that time has passed so just so you know and lastly from scott uh Scott says, uh, interesting info for our troubleshooting toolboxes. He says, when I upgraded to a 2018 MacBook Pro uh, from a 14, 2014 MacBook Pro, I had to replace all of my, of course, USB and Firewire hubs. I bought a USB-C hub from Amazon and uh, it had uh, multi. It was actually a Thunderbolt 3 dongle. That had, you know, USB 8 and 1 kind of thing with HDMI and USB 3 ports and an SD reader and even power delivery, 100 watt power delivery for his uh, 
for his MacBook so it could do all the things. He says, uh, things were all well and good at first, but then I kept having issues connecting to any Wi-Fi. I thought the issues were the Wi-Fi at my parents' house where I was visiting at the time. But when I got back to my place, lo and behold, the problem persisted. So via troubleshooting, I discovered that this off-brand USB-C hub was putting out enough electromagnetic interference to screw up the Wi-Fi. So I stopped using that hub and picked up an Apple HDMI adapter. The primary purpose of this hub was for an external monitor. Problem solved. Uh, yeah, I think this is uh, certainly USB you know, or anything electronic can cause issues with uh, electromagnetic interference. I think this one is more of a beware. You get, you get what you pay for, you know, cheap and worth it is often true when it comes to some of these knockoff or off. I don't want to say knockoff, but off brand, uh, you know, electronics that we buy on Amazon because I run several USB C hubs and Thunderbolt three d hubs and dongles and stuff here and have never had a problem with Wi-Fi with them. But, you know, I'm running the ones from OWC and CalDigit and Satechi and like the companies that that, you know, have to be re responsible for what they make because they want you to buy something in the future from them. So I they test for these things. And it's one of the reasons we really like OWC and, and, and these other companies, too. Right. Because they test for these things. So. Uh, you know, buyer beware and all that stuff. I, I'm, I'm John and I are, you know, always interested in, you know, saving money. If you can get the same thing for less by all means, but sometimes it ain't the same. Anything. Yeah, well, that's a easy place to, uh, to skimp on, you know, right. shielding and, and things like that, or whoever made it, especially if it, you know, it's not uh, FCC certified because I think a lot of things you uh, you have to go through some process to uh, make sure that it doesn't, you know, <laughs> destroy all communications in the neighborhood. Right. Right. Yeah. Good point. Good point. So. All right, folks. Sweet. Well, so the next episode will uh, hopefully be recorded live from Max Stock. I will because why not uh, also try to stream it to the uh, to the live stream uh, I, assuming the hotel Wi-Fi works then that will work and if it doesn't then it won't work uh, but we will attempt so it'll be Saturday evening for those of you that want to uh, tune in from other parts beyond feel free Saturday I think uh, it's let's figure sometime around 6 30 7 p.m central daylight time chicago time for those of you if you want to there you go uh john i think it's just it's, i like i'm having trouble even saying the words but certainly for us we are proving that usb is better than firewire for our audio needs and it just doesn't feel right to even say those words except the proofs in the pudding and We've ever since mid last episode, when I switched from FireWire to USB because things went flaky again, things have been uh, smoother than they've been in, in, I'll say, years, in fact. So it's crazy. Nice. Uh, yeah, I'll take it. Nominate us for the podcast awards at podcastawards.com. I think that exists throughout July. It certainly was still good as of this morning, but. That's in the past for all of you right now. But yeah, please, we would love to have your nominations and sign up for our weekly newsletter. We would love to be able to send you our show notes right to your email box with all the great links and stuff that we've mentioned and everything so that you don't have to come and search it out. We'll just deliver it to you. But you got you do have to come and search it out in order to get it sent to you because it'd be creepy if we just sent it to you out of the blue. Also, we don't necessarily know your email address, and that would make it even creepier. So, MacGeekGab.com is where you go to sign up for uh, for that. Uh, thanks to Cashfly, of course, for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Thanks to our sponsors, our new sponsor, MintMobile.com slash MGG. Go there. Sign up. You're going to love it. You do get a seven-day free trial, so, you know, there you go. 
Uh, and of course, Linode at linode.com slash MGG, smilesoftware.com slash podcast, otherworld computing at maxsales.com, barebones software at barebones.com, Eero at Eero.com slash MGG. Thanks to all of them. Thanks to all of you. Thanks for all your questions. Thanks for hanging out in the chat room. Thanks for listening. That's really it. Thank you in advance for telling your friend about this show. Really, seriously, we would love that. John, are you still here, Mr. Braun? Mm. Yes. Okay. I have a secret message for you. Oh? It, you, it, it, this will only make sense if you played records backwards in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, okay. Do you need that one more time? It's a secret message, so I can only play it twice. <laughs> okay. Made up.